Well, hello, hockey fans. Welcome back to THW Live. It is June 24th, 2021, still near the end of the conference finals. And God, we're going to have July 4th Stanley Cup finals. Who would have ever thought that come last year? But welcome aboard. Figure, you know, we did the San Jose Sharks last week. Figure this would be the perfect time to stay out west with a team that a lot of people are paying attention to. And it's the perfect opportunity to bring perhaps one of the most respected voices, at least that I know, of the Los Angeles Kings. The mayor himself, Mr. John Hoven. Hello, John. How are you doing? Thanks for having me. I appreciate you joining us here. So just first and foremost, how are you doing? Doing great. You know, we're in that sort of weird time of the season where uh, if the team that you cover is not in the playoffs, then, you know, you're already looking ahead to the draft. And uh, normally we'd have the NHL awards. But uh, right now it's all about the draft and the expansion draft this year as well. Absolutely. Lots of stuff. Big off season ahead. And it seems a lot of teams that are out of the playoffs are looking square at the Los Angeles Kings because of what they could potentially be doing. And, you know, fans, if you have, if you don't follow um, him out there at mayor NHL change that because he's pumped out a ton of content all around the Kings, what they might be doing. And a lot of t um, other teams are very interested in what's going on. So let's just jump right into this. So sure. you recently wrote an article um, as I think a lot of people just assume that the Kings would go after Jack Eichel. And you said, eh, not so fast. And you put an article out there saying that the Kings are possibly looking at a different direction. Why do you think ultimately, you just, is it just there's not a fit there? Or what do you make of that situation? Well, I think it comes down to a number of different things. First of all, what's the cost to get him? And, and, and these factors could be in any particular order, depending upon what day of the week it is, right? So what, what's the cost to get him? And if the, the rumored cost, which is the equivalent of four first round draft picks, or somewhere in that, in that vicinity, um, that's a very steep price for the LA Kings to pay. And while some fans might look at that and say, well, what's the problem? They have an abundance of riches. They have plenty of prospects uh, and, and their pool is almost full essentially. So any future draft picks would have less value to them in that sense. And the reality is that they really have their eyes set on spending the majority of their high-end assets on getting a defenseman. They feel that when you look at their prospect pool, and by the way, shameless plug, starting tomorrow, we have our annual prospect rankings coming out on mayorsmanner.com. So people can really get into where do they view and how do guys slot in, you know, defensemen forwards, goaltenders and whatnot. But um, they're, if their top of the food chain assets are going to be used on a defenseman, they probably don't have the additional assets on top of that to go out and get a guy like Jack Eichel. So it's just, First of all, we can start at the asset cost. And second thing would be obviously the injury. And nobody really knows what the true injury situation is. So for us to spend time speculating on it would really be a waste of everybody's time. Is he okay? Is he not okay? Does he need surgery? Does he not need surgery? What's the recovery time on that surgery? You would need a full clean bill of health before you commit $10 million a season, you know, for multiple years ahead on top of the assets that you already gave up in order to be able to commit that to a player like Jack Eichel. So it's taking nothing away from him and what he's capable of and, you know, how he's probably going to terrorize the league for the next 10 years. Uh, it's just that from an LA Kings perspective, primarily their assets and their, their direction is going somewhere else. And you probably also could take a look at some, some other, we'll call them secondary or tertiary factors as well. You look at Gabe Velarde, a player who had his own injury uh, history, albeit it's a different injury coming off a back situation compared to a neck, but just having to go through that as an organization and to nurse the player back to health and to wait and to be patient, you know, they've already sort of been down that road. And uh, to take on another potentially major injury risk at this time is probably just too much. And so whenever I say things like that, people always like to point to Eichel's statistics. And so I, I can't say it enough. It doesn't take away from Jack Eichel, the player, who he is and what he means to the National Hockey League. It just means when you look at the L.A. Kings, you typically trade for a position of need. And right now, getting that Another center, I should say, is just probably not what they need as much as they need some other things to round out uh, what they're trying to accomplish here with the recreating of the Los Angeles Kings. So, John, that does lead to two questions I think a lot of fans would, would follow up on. You mentioned kind of part one with they'd be looking for a defenseman. I know a name that's been kind of thrown out there is Seth Jones. Now, he's a right-handed shot, and it seems the Kings might be interested in more left-handed shot like what do you think that they would target in terms of an of a defenseman especially if it's high end 
Yeah, whenever we're having these conversations, uh, we always like to joke around there or at least mention that context is important, right? Because fantasy yeah. hockey people and and Xbox GMs, as we like to call them on Twitter, they love to chase the big names. So they want the Seth Jones, the Dougie Hamilton, whoever the flavor of the week is. And the reality is you, when, when you're putting a team together, it's a little bit like putting a puzzle together, right? So you have to make sure that you have the right mix of 23 players. You're not putting an all-star team together. You're not putting a fantasy team together. And so depth charts become very important. Righty, lefty, age, experience, things like that. And the Kings are pretty much uh, set on the right-hand side. So, of course, they have Dowdy on the right side. They have Matt Roy on a second pair. They have uh, Sean Walker on their third pairing on the right side. And they also have... Uh, Austin Strand, they have Kale Clegg, who can play over on the right side, and they're really excited about Brock Faber, who was a second-round pick last year. He spent the year with the University of Minnesota and Team USA, had a phenomenal World Junior, winning a gold medal, and he'll be back with Team USA in Minnesota next year, probably turn pro in about 12 months from now. So they think that Brock Faber is coming sooner rather than later, and although he wouldn't be expected to step into the National Hockey League immediately, you could see him in the NHL in two years from now, right? One more year of college, a year in the AHL, and then potentially see him in the National Hockey League lineup. So they're fairly comfortable with what they have coming on the right side. The left side is definitely a bit more of a work in progress, and, and that's why a lot of their effort and energy is being directed, and assets ultimately will be directed over to that left-hand side. Um, in terms of a guy like Seth Jones, he, he certainly could be in, in the equation. Uh, it, it's a right shot, like you mentioned, instead of a left shot. So it comes with additional trade-offs. And what, what is it going to cost to get Seth Jones? Probably going to cost you three assets, probably looking at a roster player, a prospect, and a draft pick somewhere in that range. And if that's the case, you could see the Kings moving a guy like Sean Walker. Um, you might have to move a Matt Roy. That, that sort of changes the dynamic of what they're doing short-term on the right side. Long term, I mentioned Brock Faber coming in. You probably have Brock Faber playing on the second pair. And you have Matt Roy on the third pair, which can mm -hmm. potentially squeeze Sean Walker out if he doesn't move over to the left side. So you're really looking sort of big picture. You're looking beyond this summer. And mm -hmm. uh, a tweet the other day that we put out probably summed it up best. It's kind of like looking forward to prom. If you don't have a date for the prom in October, that's okay. You want to start getting your list pulled together, but you better have a date for the prom come March. And that's kind of where the LA Kings are. Their mm. current focus is not on getting a defenseman this summer. If they're able to work a deal out because of some teams that are in cap situations or expansion yeah. draft situations, they're ready to pull the trigger on a deal right now. They've been in talks with many teams over the last six or eight months and just haven't found the right mix. But if they aren't able to get the defenseman this summer, they can sort of wait it out until – the right guy becomes available. And that right guy, as you mentioned, he's a, he's a left shot. He's about 24 years old and uh, has a bright future in front of him in the National Hockey League and could play potentially on that top pair alongside Drew Doughty for the next couple of years. Mm. So is there anybody else kind of as, at a level below Eichel forward-wise that might interest the Kings? Like you think, I think of names, Sam Reinhardt, Apparently Matthew Kachuk wants out of Calgary. Not sure what to make of that. But are there going to be anybody there that the uh, Kings would look at? Look, what the Kings are trying to accomplish on the forward front is they're looking to get two forwards. One is a top six guy that could potentially play up on the top line with Kopitar this coming season uh, and, and a top nine player. So a middle six guy, if you will, could play on the second line, but ultimately he'll probably end up on the third line. And the, the idea really here is to get some bridge players, getting some guys that have significant NHL experience, not guys that are 24 years old that only have 50 games of experience not upcoming rookies. On the forward side, they're looking for experienced goal scorers, guys that have a track record of being able to put the puck in the net because they feel they need to add offense to the team and they need to buy themselves some time until guys like Arthur Kalia uh, ends up maturing. Byfield will be in the NHL next year until he fully matures. Uh, guys like Akil Thomas, Sammy Fagamo. I could talk for an hour about their yeah. prospect pool, especially on the forward front. So these guys... A lot of these were first year in, uh, first year professionals last year playing in the American League, playing for the Ontario Reign. They still need some additional seasonings, seasoning. So as excited as people get about an Alex Turcotte, and boy, he's going to be a great player, uh, drives offense and gives you a lot more than just points. Mm -hmm. Turcotte's probably another six to 12 months away from becoming a full-time NHL player. He most likely will start the year in the American League. So they need some other players in that NHL roster or on that NHL roster. You mentioned Sam Reinhart. He would be a fantastic addition for LA simply because 
He's, he's a versatile player who can play in that top six. They can play him at center if they want to. They can move Velarde to the wing temporarily. Uh, they, could, they could play him up on, on the wing, on the top line with Kopitar. They could do a lot of different things with a guy like Sam Reinhardt. You mentioned Matthew Kachuk. I tweeted out a couple of weeks ago. If there's one player that instantly comes to mind that the Kings would push all their chips to the table on and try to go out and get, it would be a guy like Matthew Kachuk. And it's really quite simple. They don't have anybody like that in the organization, in the pipeline. When you talk about what they have at center, at forward, there's nobody like a Matthew Kachuk. There might not even be another player like him in the National Hockey League, let alone inside the Kings organization. So, I mean, some other names to take a look at would be Schwartz, Bertuzzi. Uh, I think ultimately what it's going to come down to is what players end up becoming available. And, and it sounds cliche, but it's true. The Kings are interested in just about every player that's out there right now that would be available. So they're going to take a look at free agency. They're going to take a look at teams that are up against it from a cap perspective. And they're going to be taking a look at any opportunities they can pounce on when it comes to the expansion draft. And so right now, it, it, the, the list is quite long. Absolutely. The Mayor John Hoven joining us here on THW Live. And uh, you mentioned at the beginning, the next thing that we're really going to be focusing on is the expansion draft in Seattle and, you know, who ultimately the Kraken might take from the Kings and just kind of looking at the situation kind of on my own. But you know, we'll ask you what your thoughts are here. It seems to me that there are four, maybe five forwards that are, are I would say pretty safe in my opinion. That'd be I follow. I would be Kempe, Kopitar, Leah Sanderson, and I'd even throw Trevor Moore into that conversation. Mm -hmm. And then there's a few defensemen and you mentioned them at the top there with all the righties and Dowdy and Walker and, and Matt Roy. Where do you think, who, who do you think the Kraken might target here? Because it seems like that there's a few candidates that they could look at for sure. Yeah. Uh, so right now up on the homepage of mayorsmanner.com, we do have our outlook for the expansion draft. Basically once a month throughout the season, we've mm -hmm. kind of updated the list based upon guys that have moved up or moved down and also in checking with our internal sources inside the team. And from all uh, indications that we're getting, they're going to go the seven, three and one route, which means they'll protect one goaltender. Of course, that would be Cal Peterson. That would leave Jonathan Quick exposed. We can come back to him in a minute. On yep. the defensive side, they'll go with three guys, which would be Dowdy, Roy, and Walker. That does leave someone like uh, Oli Mata. It also leaves Kale Clegg exposed. Austin Strand, if you're looking for a, for a big right-handed shot there as well. And among the forwards, you, you hit the guys that are there, the top five uh, of their seven that would be protected. Right now, for six and seven, they're probably looking at Carl Grunstrom and Dustin Brown. And uh, I know that people sort of raise their eyebrows when I say Dustin Brown, a 37-year-old player who's near the end of his career. But the reality is the Kings, much like their cap situation, they're in a really good position for the expansion draft. I remember the last expansion draft, there was a lot of hand-wringing back and forth about do they protect uh, Derek Forbert, do they protect Braden McNabb. Ultimately, they protected Forbert, of course, and McNabb was taken by Vegas. This time around, there's not really a lot of hand-wringing. All of their top prospects, all the names that we were talking about earlier, mm -hmm. Byfield, Velarde, Jared Anderson, Dolan. I mean, we can talk on and on. That whole group of players, they're all exempt from the draft. And so it makes Rob Blake's job much, much easier. It also leaves them with this sort of interesting position where they have two spots almost available, if you will, um, among their forwards so they could swing a deal in advance of the expansion draft where other teams are trying to swing deals because they don't have enough room for the guys to protect that they want to keep in this case of the kings they actually could take on right now uh one or even two forwards prior to the expansion draft and they could swap them out if you will replace uh grunstrom and or brown on that list so brown being the most interesting name on that list only because he led the la kings in goals last year he's had sort of a, a a rejuvenation in his uh, career over the last couple of seasons with the new coaching staff and whatnot. And, uh, you know, if, if you if you were to lose Dustin Brown, and, and I'll admit, there's probably a less than 5% chance that he's selected by the Kraken. But if you lose Dustin Brown for some weird reason, right, uh, maybe they take him and trade him. Maybe they flip him, right? If, if you lose Dustin Brown, uh, you, you're sort of robbing Peter to pay Paul because now instead of needing two forwards, now they need three forwards. Yep. He played on the top line with Andre Kopitar. And like I said, he led the team in goals last year. So uh, you, you, you're probably looking to keep Brown and, and, you know, he'll probably sign a one year extension once you get beyond the final year of his contract. And uh, he, he will stay with the LA Kings and play out his tenure would be my expectation at this point. A long winded answer, but it's important for context to get back to your question. Who do I think Seattle would take? Uh, on defense, you're, you're probably looking at Kale Clegg or Ole Mata, and it comes down to who are you more comfortable with? Do you want to go with the sort of 
slow and steady experience of, of a guy like Oli Mata. Uh, keep in mind that the assistant general manager there in, in Seattle has experience with them and knows him very well uh, when he was in Pittsburgh. So they know what they're getting in an Oli Mata. And, and if you want to get, uh, if you want to gamble a little bit more, uh, and, you, and you want to take a younger defenseman with a lot of upside taken in the second round. He can play the right side, can play the left side, offensive-minded guy and Kale Clegg, you know, just had a small cup of coffee in the NHL. His future is probably all in front of him right now after a great career in the WHL. So those are two guys there. I don't think that the Kraken will take Jonathan Quick, uh, primarily because I think that there will be too many other goaltenders that are available that will be too enticing. And when people try to make the connection back to Marc-Andre Fleury, I just don't see – the comparable uh, flower, of course, was coming off the Stanley Cup run with the Penguins, and he was three years younger than what Quick is at this particular point in time. So uh, I don't see Quick being taken by the Kraken. And I guess that leads right directly into what I had listed next. What is Jonathan Quick's future, assuming that he's not taken by the Kraken? Well, he's a very valuable member of the LA Kings. He's, he's what they call the core four, along with Kopitar, Brown, and Doughty. Um, he, obviously, uh, you know, a holdover from the Stanley Cup years. And while he might not be a starting goaltender going forward, it's probably Cal Peterson's, you know, net as we move forward. Uh, Jonathan Quick is, is certainly more than a serviceable backup. His contract is affordable. Uh, the Kings aren't in a cap position. He's actually at about uh, he's on a discount from a cash perspective. Uh, it's going to get lost in the math here. But you have the you know, you have the cap hit and you have the cash hit. His cap hit is higher than what his actual cash outlay is. So, uh, you know, if you're trying to control your budget coming out of the pandemic, Quickie will give you that. So, and he's a great leader. He's, he's one of the, the true locker room leaders on this team and has been for over a decade. Very few players I've ever been around have the fiery, you know, sort of personality and what burns inside of him to win on a nightly basis. He's one of those guys that definitely hates to lose probably more than he likes to win. So uh, Quick will be around and he'll be the, uh, the backup goaltender until another team comes calling and uh, wants to, you know, shore up their goaltending. And then, you know, the Kings will have to cross that bridge when they get there. Get there. Absolutely. John got two more for you. We're going to just talk a touch sure. base on the draft real quick and got the eighth overall pick. And you mentioned how stock loaded one of the best farm systems in the NHL. There's some very intriguing names in that spot, depending on how the first seven picks go. Any leaning on what they might be trying to look at there? I mean, I think of somebody immediately like a Luke Hughes, who he's got the skating that the scouts are saying he's got. That'd be a wonderful addition. But what are you, what are you thinking there? Uh, I, I'd be a little bit surprised right now sitting here today, and obviously a lot can change over the next month before the draft. I'd be a little surprised if they pick in the eighth spot. I think it kind of comes down to a couple of different things. Number one, I see them. I know, I know they're very interested in moving up because their target is one of those top four defensemen. You mentioned Hughes. I'd be very curious if he was able to get past New Jersey, who's obviously, I think they're at fourth, so he's quite a bit more, uh, uh, quite a bit higher up on the board. Uh, that would leave you with two other defensemen. I think that probably their best trade target might be to go after Detroit and try to swing a deal there to move up a couple of spots. Eight is, is just like, it's one or two spots too low, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. You know, if they were, if they were sitting in that sixth spot, they probably would be able to, to get one of those top four defensemen, which is what they're targeting. So, you know, they have the assets not only from draft picks this year, but also next year. They have a couple extras in the second and third round. They have some some picks next year they can move and package and pay the tax to, to move up a couple of spots. So I think that's their target. If that doesn't materialize, and there's no guarantee that it will, this is such a weird year, the way that people value draft picks. They could either value them less because of their scouting uh, you know, over the last year where they can uh, value them more. And it really depends which team you're talking to. Um, I know the Kings is an example. They've had scouts all over the world, uh, you know, all over the globe in various leagues scouting in person. So they feel very well prepared for this draft. Um, if they're not able to get one of those defensemen, I think you'll probably see them look to trade down. And the reason there would be at eight, you get down to about maybe 12, maybe 15 in that sort of bracket area. And, and the players somewhat become interchangeable. It just boils down to preference. And so in that case, the Kings might look to move down, take the additional assets, even though they don't need them right now. That just gives them even more assets from which to trade for that defenseman when the time comes, like I mentioned earlier. So uh, I think there's a lot of movement that the Kings will be looking to make in the draft this year. People have asked, do you think they're going to package the number eight pick to go out and get a player? My only comment to that would be, I'd be very surprised if they did that prior to the draft. Uh, only because I think that their their A move 
is to try to move up. And so you would trade the eight pick for a player until you all but were guaranteed that, you know, one through, uh, let's call it two through seven, because I don't think anybody's getting number one if uh, if they were all but guaranteed that two through seven were, were untouchable. Absolutely. John Hoban joining us here on THW Live. Last question for him. You know, we kind of brushed on the, on the off season here. And now we start to look ahead to next year and assuming they can land a player or two, like you mentioned, I'm curious about the playoffs for them for this coming year, only because the division's not that great. And it was a struggle to find a fourth team in that division. I wonder if they make the right sort of moves. Can we think about the Kings making a playoff run in 21, 22? I think it's playoffs or bust this next coming season. I think it's time. Uh, you know, they've gone through a couple of down years. They've had their top five picks. They've traded away a plethora of fan favorites and core guys and Jake Muzzin, Tyler Toffoli, Tanner Pearson, et cetera. It's now time to turn the page. And, you know, I would say also that quietly there was a lot of disappointment in the organization that they didn't make the playoffs this year. You looked at that reconfigured division this year and the fourth seed was at the beginning of the year everyone thought it was up for grabs and it was it just happens to be that at the beginning of the year everybody thought they'd be fighting Minnesota uh, for the fourth seed and in the end they were fighting St. Louis for the fourth seed so you know they should have made the playoffs this year they just weren't as far enough along as they thought they were with some of their young kids and sort of taking that next step Uh, we saw some struggles with Gabe Velarde obviously the team is still high on the future of Velarde but we saw him as a you know, really a first year pro or excuse me, a first year NHL player, just had a cup of coffee the year before struggling. So when you look ahead, that's why getting those two experienced forwards are so critical. They think that if they were, if they're able to land those two forwards uh, this summer, they believe that they're a playoff team for next year. And, you know, you're going to see a little bit of shuffling in that division. Like you mentioned, Arizona's on the way out. Seattle will replace them. We have no idea at this time what the Seattle team will look like. And then uh, Colorado won't be in the division anymore. You'll get You'll get Edmonton back. You'll get Vancouver back. So then uh, Vegas, probably the class of the division. No, no argument there. But the Kings should be able to slip into the playoffs next year. And uh, again, it, it, things, things all begin with what they do with the roster. This roster mm-hmm. right now will not make the playoffs next year. And that's mm-hmm. why general manager Rob Blake and his team of uh, you know, coaches and management people are looking to improve the roster. They, they want to make the playoffs next season. Well, John, we could talk to you forever about this, but th- this is why you follow at Mayor NHL on Twitter. Make sure you read his stuff. I'll share the links out um, so you guys can catch up on everything that he's done. John, thank you so much for joining us here. We really appreciate your time getting us caught up on all things Los Angeles Kings. Well, thanks for having me. Anytime. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Fans, stay tuned for part two. We're going to continue our Kings conversation. All right, we have reached part two of THW Live on June 24th, 2021. I am your host, Mark Shag, and Lan. Listen to part one, having the mayor, John Hoban. He is one of my favorite writers out there. Listen to his podcast, read his stuff. Always full of knowledge, very connected to the Kings. One of the more trustworthy sources that I have. And he was just fabulous on everything from Eichel to Jones to... Matthew Kachuk to the expansion draft. Just give it a listen if you uh, missed any of it. Make sure you don't miss any of our interviews and any of our podcasts as well. Make sure you hit that like button on Facebook. Subscribe on YouTube. We're on Spotify. We're on Apple. We're on Android. We're on iHeartRadio. You get our show and you get all the other shows that we do as well over many teams. So if you need something to listen to, we we, we got you covered here. So now we're going to move on to part two of this week's show, we're going to continue on with the Kings, and we've got two of our writers joining in on the panel here, Zachary Weiner and Austin Stanovich. Hi, guys. Welcome to the show. Hey, how you doing, Mark? Thanks for having us on. No, we appreciate Thank you. you. I appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate you both tuning in here. Um, Austin, we'll start with you, and, you know, kind of, um, you know, I started with John talking about the whole Jack Eichel situation, and he made the argument that that's not a priority for the Kings. I want to get your take on that. Do you feel like that they need to go after a guy like Jack Eichel, knowing that he is a number one center and can dramatically impact a team? Do you feel like that that's um, a road the Kings should go down in your opinion? No, I don't think that there should be any interest from the Kings. I don't think there ever was any interest from the Kings based off the reports I've seen. Um, It 
doesn't make sense for him. You still have Anze Kopitar. He's still going to be a good player in this league three to five years. He's aging really well. And then by that time, Quinn Byfield's your guy as a number one center. You also have Alex Turcotte. You have Gabe Velarde. Those are two guys you're already having to move to the wings. You just you don't need another top end center. It just doesn't make sense for him. And the cost is going to be too high. They're never going to trade Byfield. You really don't want to trade anyone else for him, especially if they're looking at other players that would cost those assets. Well, Zach, do you feel like they should go after Eichel? Yeah, I would absolutely agree. It's not the best move for the Kings right now. It's it's sort of hard to say just knowing how great of a player Eichel is, but there's a few reasons why the Kings shouldn't go after him. I mean, I think the first reason is just based purely on what the Kings would have to send the other way. Uh, considering how many prospects LA has, I'm sure Buffalo would want to take a significant piece of that that the Kings don't really want to give up. In terms of a roster player that the Kings would send the other way, in terms of who has value, I don't think Buffalo would be that interested in Dustin Brown just because of his age. Uh, so that would mean a lot of the trade from the side of the Kings would be coming from the prospect pool. Uh, and when you're getting a player like Jack Eichel, Buffalo would pretty much have their pick if the Kings were going to trade him. I mean, you would think it would start with Turcotte possibly. I don't think the Kings are willing to trade Byfield. And then on top of that, you'd have to add at least a couple more prospects and picks as well, mm. uh, in addition to some roster player. So at the end of the day, it just doesn't seem like the right time. And it just seems like too much that they're going to have to give back. And for the Kings, I mean, they're almost com- being done with the rebuild. So I think it makes the most sense to hold everyone, keep all the options open and wait for the rebuild to settle in before making any blockbuster moves and then in turn my second issue with the Nikel trade is just the log jam it creates at center I just don't know that uh if they acquire Eichel um they just have so many options at center that I think it might be really difficult because if you think about what the center lineup is going to look like you then have Eichel, Kopitar, Velarde and then you have one more spot to fill in every other center prospect that the Kings have and obviously you can move guys to the wing but it's just one less roster spot for a player to develop in. And yeah, I agree with both of you. I, I don't think the Kings should be looking at it. I just don't see the fit. Um, you know, there's the medical questions and, you know, they will, I mean, I'm sure they're willing to take in the contract, but there's just, there's a lot of other questions out there. I'm actually going to have a couple pieces in the near future. One specifically about Columbus where, you know, they've been kind of linked together where, you know, they should actually proceed with a little bit of caution there. They should absolutely investigate it, but they should proceed with some caution. But then there's three teams that I feel like that would be a really good fit in terms of you know being able to meet the asking price. And I think it's Minnesota. I think it's Colorado. Could you imagine Eichel joining that team? That's scary. And then um, I know some people might not like this, but I think Carolina would actually be an interesting fit because Carolina has a lot of what Buffalo would want. But yeah, I agree. I don't think the Kings are going to be in that conversation. Seems like everybody here has mentioned that. So let's kind of look, move on then because they do need to make moves. If they're going to be a playoff team, they do need to do something. So Zach, I go to you. If not Eichel, is there maybe one or two players that they should be targeting here? Yeah, for sure. So I really like the idea of the Kings going after guys in free agency rather than through trades. This allows them to hold on to more of their prospects. uh, And also Mm -hmm. the Kings don't have any issues with cap space. So I don't think there's any reason not to go after some players in free agency. Um, On the forward side of things, I think Brandon Saad could be a good target. Uh, We all know the Kings have had issues on offense and scoring goals in in the past few seasons. So, I mean, 2.54 goals a game on average last season, 27th in the league. I mean, you can't really score that often and expect to make the playoffs. Uh, so Brandon Saad last season, 15 goals and nine assists in 44 games. So uh, he's overall just an offensively minded winger who could fill a second or even first line role potentially. And he doesn't require a crazy contract either. Evolving Hockey projects a four year, $4.9 million contract. And considering what they just gave I follow, that sounds pretty reasonable. Mm-hmm. And then um, in terms of de- a defenseman, I think getting a defenseman in free agency might be a little bit harder. Obviously, Dougie Hamilton is a big name out there. Uh, but it just, I think in terms of salary reasons, having nearly $20 million locked up in older defensemen, when you combine his potential salary with what Drew Doughty's getting paid, it just doesn't seem like a good idea for the Kings. Uh, and we all, we all know the Kings are looking for a defenseman. 
Uh, but it's, uh, I think it's tough to get exactly what they're looking for, especially when it comes to the age requirement of 25 years uh, or younger is what we've heard. So I think potential targets could be Vince Dunn or Ryan Graves. If they wanted to go with a more significant ad, I think Travis Sanheim or Jacob Slavin. Uh, but I think an ideal target would be Travis Sanheim. He's 25 years old. He shoots left. Um, he can put up some points, three goals and 12 assists in 55 games last season. So not great, but I think he has more to him than that. And in terms of contract, uh, he's a restricted free agent. Evolving Hockey projects a two-year, $4.3 million contract. And then in terms of the money, like Saad, it isn't too bad. And I think he could be uh, a good target if they're making a, a larger move. All right, Austin, who do you think they should target um, if it's not Eichel? Yeah, I mean, uh, Zach made a really good point there about how hard it is because of what they're looking for. They want a really specific group of players this offseason. At forward, they want bridge guys. They don't want anyone that's going to take up future roster spots for guys like Kaliev and Turcotte and Byfield. So it makes it really difficult. You know, you're not going to go out and sign a guy in free agency. Most UFAs want that big contract. You're not going to be giving it to them, right? So I think it makes it difficult. Sam Reinhardt makes a lot of sense to me because of that. Uh you know, he's already got a little bit of term on it. He might be able to get him on the cheap from Buffalo because he wants out. Eichel wants out. There might be a bit of a fire sale there. Um, if they can make that happen, I think it would be great. And, again, I think they're looking for that big left-hand defenseman that can provide offense for him. Um, I think it would be interesting to uh, kind of monitor the situation in Tampa Bay right now. We know they're going to have cap problems. Does Sergeant have become available? A guy like that becomes available. You have to go after him. Justin Morgan Riley maybe is available in Toronto, but – I mean, obviously Toronto media wants him to trade everyone, so who knows how true that is. Uh, if he does become available, though, make a big run at him, he'd be perfect for him. Uh, I wouldn't – I don't really expect them to make any huge moves this summer, to be completely honest with you. I don't think the player they want is going to become available, so I don't think they're going to make the move. I think they're going to be patient on this one. Interesting. Okay, right. um, so we'll, Austin, we'll go back to you here for the next question, and – yeah, they, you know, they're obviously going to be looking to make moves. You know, if the player is there or not. Um, it seems like that they're ready to turn the page. It seems like that they're ready to make a playoff push. So my question is, are these Kings ready to move out of the rebuilding phase? And do they honestly expect to have um, a legitimate playoff push upcoming here in 21-22 as a result? I think the answer to both those is yes. I think they are moving away from the rebuilding phase. I don't think they're going to go all in. I don't think they're going to push all their chips into that. They're not going to start trading away all their best prospects to try and make a big push for the cup or anything, but they're, I think they're done trading away vets, trying to stockpile picks, trying to stockpile prospects. I think that that's done. They're going to be trying to get guys with NHL experience to make this roster better and to start pushing to compete at this level. I do not expect them to have a top 10 pick next year. That would be very surprising to me. And I, I think considering how weak that Pacific division is looking to be, they have a good chance to make playoffs next year. All right, Zachary, same question for you. Are they ready to move out to that rebuilding phase and can they push for a playoff spot? Yeah, I think so. And I mean, the Kings certainly believe so as well. I mean, we heard it at the beginning of last season. They talked about making the playoffs. Obviously that didn't happen, but again, their goal this coming season is to be a playoff team. Uh, and to me, the Kings are sort of in a weird spot where they're in between a rebuilding phase and going for the playoffs. They aren't, they weren't quite good enough to make the playoffs this past season, but they also have nearly all the pieces they need in the pipeline to be a good team. Mm -hmm. I don't think they need to be worried about getting as high a pick as possible. Uh, like Austin mentioned too, in terms of a top 10 pick, I don't see it. And I don't think that's really what they're going for. I think they should try and make the playoffs, but I think the main goal needs to stay on figuring out who the main players are going to be in terms of the future core. Uh, and that has to be done by slotting guys into the lineup at different times, which, I mean, that can be difficult when you're trying to make the playoffs, when you're slotting guys into the lineup and you're seeing a different lineup uh, pretty often, but I definitely think it's possible for the Kings to make the playoffs and what we're thinking is going to be the normal divisions again. And um, I think they can definitely make a push. All right, Zachary Weiner and Austin Stanovich joining us on THW Live. It's our Los Angeles Kings panel getting ready for what could be an interesting offseason in Los Angeles and how different this team could be. So, Zach, let's go back to you. And, you know, the expansion draft is obviously something everybody's going to be interested in. 
mean, we're, we're less than a month away now, if you can believe that. And we're going to be starting to pick up the speed on if there's going to be side deals, if there's going to be, you know, whatever's going on there. Kings are in an interesting position because it seems that, you know, they're going to probably go the seven, three, one route. Um, seems that the defensemen are kind of set. Seems the forwards are mostly set, but I just wonder who do you think will be available? Or who do you think the Kraken might be taking off of the Kings in your opinion? Yeah, I think uh, the Kraken have a few options here. I think the main ones to consider are likely going to end up being Grunstrom, Lazat, Wagner, or Quick. I think from the Kraken's point of view, I think the best pick would be either Grunstrom or Wagner, but I think Wagner is probably the way to go there. Uh, he's quite young, 24 years old. Last season, four goals and four assists in 44 games. So production hasn't been great, but I think he has the potential to be really good uh, just from watching games this season. Uh, there certainly were times when Wagner really impressed specifically towards the end of the season, I think. Uh, I mean, he's really, really fast. I think that's his biggest asset. And I think he can build on that and become a pretty solid uh, forward. Uh, but from the Kings point of view, in terms of what they would hope for, probably uh, they would hope either Lazat or Quick. I think just for Lazat, he's been solid, but it just frees up some space down the middle. And then uh, for Quick, uh, like we've seen over the last few years, he just simply isn't the player he used to be. And while that can be a little bit sad for Kings fans, I mean, he did a ton for the team just being a brick wall, basically, in net. Uh, he just, I think the Kings wouldn't mind uh, the Kraken taking quick off their hands. Uh, if you just look at last season, goal saved above expected, 2.39 for Calvin Peterson and a negative 3.31 for quick. So I mean, Quick actually did have the better record, but I think it was mainly due to opponent. I think we saw Peterson starting a lot of those games versus Vegas and versus mm. Colorado. Um, so though it's quite not the same, it could be a similar like flurry Vegas situation. I'm not saying Quick is going to do what Flurry did in Vegas, but maybe going to Seattle lets him find find something in himself uh, from the old Jonathan Quick. But I think definitely from the Kraken point of view, Wagner is the best bet. Uh, but from the Kings point of view, I think they would hope for either Lazard or Quick. All right, Austin, what do you think about um, the Kraken's options within the Kings? Um, an interesting situation there is going to be a to save for the Kings. It sounds like they're still working on getting a deal done with him. Mm -hmm. um, if they do sign him, it's almost guaranteed they won't protect him. I think if they do get that deal done and he is left unprotected, Seattle will end up taking him. Yeah, he's a former 30-goal scorer, tons of speed, tons of offense, and they'd end up going with him if he's available. But as of right now, Kale Clegg is who I'm going with. All right, Austin, I'll stick with you. Um, we know that the Kings have one of the best farm systems out there. I mean, you obviously look top to bottom, Turcotte, Byfield, and you can go on and on with that. But you just wonder when they have that kind of you know talent ready to go, there's still obvious needs that the Kings have to address. So what do you feel like is the biggest need that they have to address this offseason on the team? I think the biggest need they have to address this season would be a top line right winger for Anze Kopitar. Dustin Brown did great last year, 17 goals, led the team. I think those numbers were inflated by a red hot power play to start the year. Towards the latter, later half of the year, he struggled a ton. He did not score many goals for him. And I think we know that he's not a top line player anymore. It's just the reality of him. He's like 36 years old. It happens. Uh, so I think they need to bring something in for him. Uh, some of the names, if Tarasenko is available in St. Louis, I think that would be a great pickup. Go back to Sam Reinhardt. He can play right wing. I think his best season in Buffalo was playing on Jack Eichel's right wing, so I think it can make a ton of sense. I also think it's that left shot defenseman, the offensive defenseman who can play on uh, either next to Drew Doughty or on that second pairing. Um, if there's not a big name available, I'd like to see him go after Mike Riley if he comes uh, to free agency from Boston. I think he's a very solid offensive guy that could kind of bridge them into when they do make that big deal. All right, Zachary, same question for you in terms of what do you feel like they have to address in the offseason? Yeah, I definitely agree with Austin there. I think, I mean, in terms of uh, the farm system specifically, I think uh, defense is something they need to address. Uh, I mean, the defensive pipeline is uh, not bad by any means. I mean, you have Tobias Grunfoot, Kale Clegg, Helen Granz. Uh, they have the young Mikey Anderson as well. Uh, but aside from that, there isn't too much, I think having the eighth overall pick at this draft uh, could be useful in that. I think they could go a few different ways with the pick, um, but since they don't have a top five pick, they might not have their choice of players. I think 
top players to look for for them to pick up uh, Luke Hughes, uh, Simon Edmondson, and Brant Clark. I think Hughes would be the best fit just in terms of offensive ability, um, but I have a hard time imagining that he'll fall to eight. Uh, that being said, there are some questions about his defensive reliability, so it certainly is possible. Uh, I wouldn't mind the Kings trading up to make sure they get a top defensive prospect because I think getting one would really be huge when it comes to finishing the rebuilding process. And I think, I mean, a lot of people are saying he used to the devils just because of the connection there with Jack. Um, but I think trading up to get one of those three guys that I mentioned could be uh, definitely beneficial. And Austin, I'll give you a chance to talk about the draft since Zach talked about it in the eighth pick and it seems like defense is the obvious need. Is that the way you see it? And could you even see a scenario if maybe, you know, the top seven don't trade down and those four um, top defensemen are gone, could they possibly trade back in a scenario like that? Yeah, I think it's possible. Um, again, they don't need high end forwards. So even if a uh, really, really good forward, I think Dylan Gunther, there's been some talk that he would drop to eight, even if he's there, He's great, but what does he do for the Kings? It's just another guy that kind of jams up their forward pipeline, so they don't really need that. I think it would be really smart to trade down, maybe get uh, one of those bridge players we've been talking about, a guy that can maybe uh, fill in at the two-center role because they need a guy. Uh, it sounds like they didn't really – they kind of think they made a mistake with Gabe Velarde last year, right? They think they jumped him in that second-line center role too early. I would imagine they maybe are going to go away from that this year, give him more time to develop, so they may need that position. If you can trade down – get that player. Perfect. You don't need another forward prospect anyways. I think it'd be smart. And I think it's possible. Well, great stuff by both of you, Zach and Austin. Thank you very much for joining our panel here on THW Live. We really appreciate your insight on the Los Angeles Kings. Hey, thanks for having us. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. And fans, uh, thank you as always for joining us. Again, if you missed any of our interview with the panel or with the mayor, John Hoven, you know, you can catch us a variety of ways, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. So all the social media platforms, Apple, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Android, you know, all the different ways of, you know, the podcast is available. Make sure you hit subscribe, make sure you hit like, you will never miss any of our interviews or any of the podcasts that we do. We thank you once again for your time. We'll be back at this time next week. I think we're going to have a Ducks um, guest and a Ducks show, but you know, we'll, you know, once we figure it out, we'll let you know. Hope you all have a great week. We'll talk to you next week here on THW Live.